Okay, if you want to go ahead and, and let folks in, Tom. I think we are ready to go. Hello, everybody. I don't know if it's hot where you are. It's very hot where I am. My, my house is not well equipped for the, the heat. But I haven't put the fan in the room, so it's quiet when I talk. So I'm suffering for the, for the group. So I'm sure you're all very appreciative of my, my torment. Yes. Courtney's giving me blue applause. Thank you, Courtney. All right, uh, well, uh, greetings everyone and welcome to this, the meeting for Carpentry or Bird Watchers for June 11th, right? And uh, today, uh, thanks to an excellent suggestion from Brody, we're going to do finches, finches at our feeders is my, my title I came up with. And so we're not gonna talk about every finch, we're gonna talk about some finches, uh, including some finches that you probably have at your feeders if you have bird feeders up. And uh, we're gonna talk about three, well, well, we'll get to it, you'll see. Um, and I'm gonna try and get it done quickly because uh, I, we're gonna try and do a fun game at the end. We're gonna try and do this uh, eBird photo quiz at the end, which is something we did once in the library when we still met in person, but Brody's excited about the eBird photo quiz. That's good, yeah. Yeah, it should be lots of fun. Um, so yeah, let me keep moving so we can get to it. Um, just quick housekeeping note, you know, we ask that you keep your mics muted when you're not actually talking. Everybody is muted, so that's great. Uh, but also unmute. And, uh, and specifically, so occasionally I go back and I rewatch the meeting to kind of critique my own, you know, performance and figure out how to do a better job. And um, in the last meeting, I made a couple of just glaring mistakes. And I'm, I'm talking and I'm excited and I'm tripping over my tongue and I say stuff that's just completely wrong. When you hear me say something completely wrong, please unmute and correct it at the time. I would much rather be corrected than, than see it after the fact and go, ah, oh, I can't believe I said that. So a few corrections, and these are the only the ones I noticed. I'm sure there were more. But I was talking about uh, where you go to see the uh, yellow-billed magpie. And I'm showing it on the map. And I'm going, oh, and you go out. What I tried to think of was that you go out San Marcos Pass up to 154 out of Santa Barbara to go to Lake uh, Kachuma, but my brain just stopped working. And in the heat of the moment, I said, you go out Casitas Pass, which is a completely different pass down here at this end, you know, the Carpinteria end of the county. And then I just said to Lake Casitas, which again, would do you no good. I don't think they even have yellow-billed magpies there. So anyway, apologies for that. And then the other one was also quite embarrassing. Uh, maybe not as consequential in terms of your day-to-day -day birding. So I was talking about the Clark's Nutcracker, and I knew I was correct that it was named for the Clark, who was a member of Lewis and Clark's you know, the expedition. But I completely spaced out about what his actual first name was. And I should know this because my son is also named William, which is his first name. So somehow I came up with Nathaniel Clark, who I'm sure there is a Nathaniel Clark somewhere, but he is not the one who discovered the Clark's Nutcracker. That was William Clark. So anyway, glad I got a chance to straighten that out. Um, Let's see. Uh, so one other piece of housekeeping, uh, Tom and, oh, Brody, I see you have your hand up. What do you have to share, Brody? So I have seen a uh, Rufus hummingbird and a uh, two Anna's hummingbird. Now, are you sure it's not uh, an Allen's hummingbird? Because they look pretty brownish too. And that's more the expected one at this time of year. I'm not, I'm not saying you didn't see a Rufus hummingbird, but I'm just saying, you know. I mean, it might have been uh, two or three yards away, so it could have. I mean, I could have been wrong, but I think well, that's what I saw, so that's what I marked it down as. Excellent. All right. Well, that's great, Brody. Um, I encourage you, uh, if you get a chance to see it again, try and get a good look at the back and really study it. So from straight on at the back, the Rufus Hummingbird most of the time is going to be brownish all the way up and down. There's going to be no green in the in the upper back, no green in the shoulder area. Yeah, I was mostly seeing it back, so that's what I mostly saw. Uh -huh. Well, that's great. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a famously difficult species pair, and and with the 
the females and the immature males, it's like so hard that, you know, some sources say, well, the only way to really tell is if you're, you're banding them and you catch them in a mist net, you're holding them in your hand, you can examine the, the specific shape of certain tail feathers to distinguish them. So very, very tricky birds, but that's great. And they're fun to see. Yeah, and it was also a cloudy day, sort of a foggy day. Huh? Yeah, but I didn't really get to see the front of it very well. In the in this hummingbird I just saw today, the in this hummingbirds I just saw today. Well, that's great. Yeah, hummingbirds are, are always worth checking out. Uh, anybody else have any fun birds you've seen in the last week that you want to share about? No, no one's jumping in? Can I share one last thing? Of course, Brody, you could always share one last thing. Thank you. <laughs> we went to Rattlesnake, me and, my, me and my dad and my sister went to Rattlesnake Canyon. Oh, wow. And did you see yeah. birds there? No, it was it really wasn't a good day for it because it was a really cloudy day up there and there wasn't much to really see. It was actually pretty cold actually. Oh yeah. wow. Well, I could use that right now. That would be, that sounds really good. I wish I could trade the, the hot office, the hot home office for, for cold Rattlesnake <laughs> Canyon. Um, okay, well, one more thing that I did want to mention. Um, so uh, your co-hosts as usual are uh, Tom Beland and Laurel Luby and Jenny Slaughter. Uh, and Jenny, I think it is, is watching the YouTube live stream, which we also have. And uh, the, we had a meeting um, in between our official meetings to talk about ways to make the, the classes more interactive and more fun, because when it's just me talking, not only do I make mistakes about Lewis and Clark, but it's just, you know, one person talking, and it's more fun when it's more interactive. So uh, Tom and Laurel, uh, I'm not sure if it's Tom or Laurel who is going to, to describe this, but they're going to share some uh, an idea that they came up with, I think is a really great idea for how we could have a more interactive meeting at a future meeting. Uh, if you're, you're talking, but you're muted, Tom, let me unmute you if I can. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Okay, so we thought that since we haven't been able to go birding together since February, <laughs> And John's presentation today was on finches and finches at our feeders that we could do a Carpinteria birders backyard count. We would like everyone to pick a day over the next week to bird in their backyard or near their yard. If possible, we would like you to enter your list in eBird and this will give us all some practice with using eBird. John has set up an eBird account called Carp Bird Watchers. When you submit your eBird, please share your list with those with that account, with the Carp Bird Watchers account. We would like all the lists submitted by Tuesday night, June 16th, so that we can compile the findings on Wednesday and John will present them at the meeting on June 18th. If you do not want to use eBird, you can email your list. You should have, you could email your list to me. You should all have my email, but we'll be sending out an email after the class with all this information for those who were not able to join today. If you want to take a photo of any of the birds in your backyard, either because you're not sure what they are, or just because you are excited to have birds in your yard, please do, and you can share those with the group either attach the photo to your eBird list or email them to me. And please let us know if we do not know what the bird is so that John could help with the identification. That's it. Yeah, or I could be wrong. As it turns out, I do that a fair amount. But... <laughs> that's okay, right. well, thanks. Yeah, that, that's great. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, you know, if you're on eBird, you know that I bird in my backyard fairly regularly these days. So I'm looking forward to contributing and I'm, I'm curious to see what we can collectively come up with in our, our collective backyard list. Uh, and if you share with that Carp Bird Watchers account on eBird, it'll make it easy to sort of summarize and smush them all together and, and see what our, our merged list looks like. Okay. Quick question? Yeah. Does it have to be Carpinteria? My house oh. is in Santa Barbara. No, I think that's actually a good thing. Let, let's okay. spread our net widely. In fact, if you can find somebody on the East Coast to join our meetings and they can put in their list, you know, then we can get a really good list going. Thank you. You're so wonderful. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Suzanne. Um, okay. Any other questions before we jump into Finches? 
No? All right, well, let's get going then. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's see. I'm going to do it like this. And I need to do one more thing. Okay, if I've done this correctly, you are seeing a finch. Someone give me a thumbs up if you see a finch. Excellent, okay. Um, so I wanted to start with this uh, quotation from Ken Kaufman. Uh, so I'm quoting from the Kaufman Field Guide to Advanced Birding, which we've talked about before. And um, I came across this passage there that I think is, is uh, very relevant to what we're talking about today. Uh, and this is in a section called The Bird Feeder as a Learning Tool. I have known some very serious birders who would never consider putting up a bird feeder at home. I'm not a feeder watcher, I'm a field birder, is a line that I've heard more than once. But for improving one's birding skills, there is tremendous value in looking at the birds at a feeder outside the window. Not for learning field marks for a lot of species, but for coming to understand how much variation there can be within one species. A feeder visited by nothing but house finches can be a powerful learning tool for the avid birder. In fact, house finch is a perfect subject for study. Most birders don't look closely at house finches at all. They can identify the species at a glance, usually, so they don't do anything more than glance. But any birder could increase his skill and his understanding of bird variation by looking closely at house finches every day of the year. Their individual variation is remarkable, not just the fact that the occasional male is orange or yellow instead of red. Look more closely. No two males are the same in the extent of the red color on the head and chest. No two females are the same in the pattern of striping below or the strength of pattern on the head. And every individual changes subtly in appearance every day as the plumage gradually becomes worn and then is replaced at the next molt. The crisp wing bars of fall become gradually narrower and duller as spring passes into summer. The soft red of the males may actually become brighter, more garish as the feathers become worn. By summer, when the adults may look ratty and drab, juveniles appear on the scene and the fresh appearance of their wings and tail and the fluffy loose appearance of their body plumage makes them stand out instantly from the faded adults. So I just thought that was fun. Um, and this is actually a really good time of year to see exactly what he's talking about. Uh, so let's talk about finches and specifically finches at our feeders. Uh, so here is a finch at a, well, not at a feeder, maybe eye in a feeder. And we will get to that species in a minute. So uh, like I like to do, uh, here is the eBird histogram for Santa Barbara County for the six species that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, we've got three finches uh, in terms of their names and then three goldfinches. And you can see from the thickness of the green uh, bars that the house finch is the most common species we're going we're gonna to look at. And uh, it is in fact the most common feeder bird in North America, I've heard. And it's, it's a pretty interesting bird. We'll talk about some, some cool stuff about it in just a minute. Um, looks like the next most common uh, of these six species in Santa Barbara County is the lesser goldfinch. So again, if you've got a seed feeder up, you know, if you've got the, the, the black bell sunflower seeds, you probably got house finches. And if you've got the, the little black you know, Niger seeds, a little thistle seeds in a sock, you probably got the lesser goldfinches. So those are their, our two most common species. After that, it looks like maybe purple finch and American goldfinch kind of come next. Lawrence's goldfinch, and then very skinny little line for Cassin's finch. Cassin's finch is actually a really tough bird to, to get in Santa Barbara County. Uh, and we'll talk about why that is in just a minute. But let's go on and, and talk about these, these birds. All right. Oh, and I always forget. I need to uh, get the bird sounds ready. Uh, so here is a recording of, of this species. Uh, this is a recording from xenocanto.org by Thomas McGarrian. And uh, give me a, a thumbs up if you actually hear this so I make sure I've got the audio working right. Call notes of that species. Thank you for the thumbs. Um, and then here is a, a more extended song type vocalization by the same species. So I have to think that a 
all of us have heard this a lot, right? This is the, the house finch that we've been talking about. And, um, you know, I always like to say plumage lies, but structure tells the truth. So I'm always telling you, you know, pay more attention to structure, the shape of the bird, the, the beak, the, the length of the wings, things like that, and be suspicious of the plumage, the, the color patterns on the bird. But with these finches, I actually think plumage is pretty important to an identification. So pay attention to their plumage and, and we'll talk about why that is. So here we are, we're looking at this, this house finch. Um, this is the male, this is the female. Um, you know, that first bird we looked at a few slides ago was also a house finch. But if you compare that house finch, like if you look at this house finch, he's got some red going on on the, the you know, the, the crown, the forecrown and the, the throat and the upper breast. Um, but if you look at this one that we were looking at a second ago, he's got a lot more red going on, right? It turns out there's a lot of variability in the amount of red, which Kaufman was talking about in that passage that I just read. But this, even though this one's a lot brighter, it has the, the brightest color in pretty much the same places on the bird, right? This bright in the throat area and up here on the crown. Um, the wings, there's not really much red there on the wings at all. The red is pretty, you know, distributed pretty, not, not only in these places, but most of it is in these places here on the bird. And that's a, a helpful clue that you're looking at a house finch as, a pair, as opposed to some of the other finches we'll look at in a minute that have the red distributed a little bit differently on the male bird. Um, but also structure is important and I'll talk about the, the structure. Well, actually let me talk about the female too. So the, the female is a like a drabber colored version of the male. She doesn't have the, the red going on that the male has. Um, but if you look, she, she does have this, this sort of brownish streaking uh, below and it's pretty smudgy streaking, right? They're not like crisp little lines, they're sort of smudgy lines, just same as the male. Um, and the, the lighter parts in between the dark lines is not super white, it's, it's kind of, you know, tan or light brown, right? So they're, they're not a very Beach. high, con What's that, Brody? Um, sort of like beige. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of names for these colors, and I've, I'm famously bad at the names for different colors. But this color that you see on this bird, whatever you want to call that, um, and uh, it it makes for a, a bird, especially you know, if you're looking at the females and trying to distinguish them. Uh, it's a pretty low contrast finch, right? It it's got it's dark and it's light, but the the two different colors are not that far apart. And the whole bird gives you this effect of a pretty sort of bland pattern, especially on the head. Like you, you know, there's some variability here, but if you look at the head of this, this bird, there isn't really a strong pattern there. It's pretty uniform looking. Okay, so that's your, your house finch plumage. Uh, now structure wise, there are uh, a couple of things that it's helpful to look for. Notice the primary extension. This is often a really useful, subtle detail to look for on birds. And that's the, on the folded wing, how far does the, do the primary feathers extend beyond the folded secondary feathers, right? So as the bird folds its wing up, you know, these are the secondaries. Those are the feathers that are closer to its body, the flight feathers closer to the body. And then these are the primaries, the flight feathers out at the, the ends of the wing, the outer ends of the wing. And when you fold them up, the, the primaries, because they're longer, stick out past the, the secondaries. And the length of the wing, determines the amount of the primary extension. So a house finch's wing is, it is, it is a length such that it has this much primary extension. So just kind of fix that in your mind because when we get to the Cassin's finch, we're gonna see that their primary extension is a little bit longer because their wings are a little bit longer and it's a useful structural clue to look for. Um, the other really useful structural thing to look for, if you're trying to distinguish the house finch from the, the next bird we're gonna see in a second, um, is the specific shape of the, the beak, and in particular, the upper edge of the beak, which is called the culmen, C-U-L-M-E-N. Uh, just a weird word that I only learned recently, but that's what it's called. Uh, if you sort of follow the upper edge of the house finch's beak, it curves downward. See how it's got that, that curved culmen there? And the, the gape, the, the part where the two uh, parts of the beak come together, is also pretty curvy. You put that together and this, this upper mandible's really got a, like a hook thing going on, right? 
So look for that. When, you, when you're studying your house finches, look at, for that little bit of a curve. It's not super dramatic, but it's there and it's, it's very useful. Okay, so let's talk about why it's useful. Oh, first let's talk about where they are. They're everywhere, All right? Here's your, your eBird sightings map. Red dots are, are sightings within the last 30 days. Uh, house finches are throughout Santa Barbara County. Um, here we're zoomed in a little bit on Carpinteria and they're still pretty much everywhere. I mean, they're not up here, but that's probably just because people aren't bird watching up there. I mean, they're probably up there too. They're just all over the place. Um, and house finches are sort of interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna save time and not really go look at their, their abundance animation, although those are fun, but I'm, I'm trying to be quick here. Uh, you know, they used to just be a Western species, the Western part of the country and, and in Mexico. And then in 1940, uh, someone was trying to sell them as cage birds back east, like I want to say New York or Long Island or somewhere like that. And apparently people didn't want to buy that person's house finches as cage birds. You know, they, they have that pretty song. You want to have it in, the, in your house and hear it. Uh, so they released them. And they released this, bat, this big batch of house finches into the wild in New York or I would say New York or somewhere around there. And in between 1940 and today, they, or within actually just a few decades, they had spread out throughout most of the eastern half of the country from that one release point. So this is a bird, you know, we talk about birds declining and uh, their range is being constricted uh, as a result of human activity. This is a bird that has dramatically expanded its range as a result of human activity to the point where again, now they're the, the most common feeder bird in, in North America. Okay, so here's another finch, a different species. And let's listen to what it sounds like. Uh, because again, with these birds, if you, if you learn the vocalizations, you're gonna be in great shape because it'll immediately tell you that, you know, which, which of these species you're looking at. They all have pretty distinctive vocalizations. Um, this is another recording by Thomas McGarrian. And you know, you, it's, it's pretty similar in character to the house finches call, but different enough that again, if you spend enough time listening to them, you can definitely tell the difference. Okay, here's the, the longer vocalization by this species and this recording is by Thomas Graves. And this is the purple finch. And, you know, in its overall pattern and, and shape and everything, it's pretty similar to the, the house finch, but there are some key differences. So the, the color is sort of a brighter red. You know, the house finch is more of a brick red usually, although sometimes depending on their diet, you actually get a yellow house finch, which is pretty wild to see. But for the most part, they're kind of this darker brick red. And the purple finch is more of this brighter red. Um, and here, I'll just back up real quick so you can just get a mental comparison. Like there's your house finch color and there's your purple finch color. And as I look at it, I think maybe part of what's going on is that the, the background color of the purple finch is pretty white, right? It doesn't have that sort of beige background color like Brody was helpfully uh, working on my, my color vocabulary. It's not that sort of beigey background color. It's more of a white background color. And you put that red over the white and it gives you this, this sort of brighter looking bird. Um, it also has a color, the, the color is more extensive on the male purple finch. I see it's got, you know, the reddish color on the wings and the back kind of more so than the, than the house finch does. And it doesn't really have the, the streak, as much of the, the brown streaking that the, the male house finch does on the purple finch. And then Brody, did you have a comment? I see you've unmuted. Um, yeah, the primary extensions are a lot um, smaller. Yeah, you know, partly I think that's the photo, you know, and, and photos can be tricky that way. You really want to study it. Um, but, you know, in general, uh, the, the primary extension on these is at least in, you know, if you're, oh. when, they, when oh. they write, the, when they write the field guides, they like, they get study skins out, right? They get the actual skinned birds in the museum collections and they sit there and they measure and they look at hundreds of them and say, okay, this is the primary extension. 
in a photo, you know, depending on the angle you get, depending on how the bird's holding the wing, it can be kind of confusing. Um, I mean, my sense is that the primary extension is pretty close on the, the purple finch to the house finch, but your mileage may vary. I haven't studied them that extensively. So if you've got both of these around, which you could well have, you're kind of in a good spot to have both of these species, um, check them out and, and see what you think. Uh, the female, uh, it's, it's got a, you know, it's got more contrast. Remember we talked about how low contrast the female house finch was, and I'll back up again just to remind you, right, this very low contrast bird. The female purple finch has a lot more contrast. The, the, you know, the light parts of it are a lot lighter. And the, the head pattern is usually, you know, it's got like a prominent uh, eyebrow going on, and then this kind of whitish line down here. It's got, you know, more of a stronger face pattern. And then structurally, the big thing is that this uh, upper edge of the beak is pretty much straight, doesn't have nearly as much of a curve as the house finch does. And same for the, the gape here between the two parts of the beak, pretty straight compared to the house finch. So look for that um, and listen for that vocalization and that will help you know that you're looking at a purple finch. And uh, again, distributed pretty widely and it's kind of hard to tell because this is showing all sightings ever and there's a lot of sightings in Santa Barbara County but it's less widely distributed than the, than the house finch. And we saw that in the, the green histogram at the beginning, right? The, the green line is, is narrower, you know, fewer, lower percentage of checklists, including purple finch. Uh, if we zoom in on it, you can see, you know, a few sightings up in Toro Canyon area is a good place to see them. Kind of up in the hills a little more tends to be where I've seen them at least. Um, but they're around. And if you learn to, you know, listen for that, that, that song, you know, that pretty distinctive song. You can you can find them pretty much throughout the area. Okay, one more species of our of our finches, um, and this one sounds like this. This is Lance Benner's recording. Is a, a longer vocalization recorded by Bruce Lagerquist. And this is our Cassin's finch. And this one uh, on the male, the plumage thing to look for is the the bright red is really concentrated on the crown and it's, it's noticeably brighter on the crown than any other part of the bird. So you can look for that. Um, the female, it's kind of got a lot of, it's sort of a contrasty bird like the female purple finch, but it's streaking is, is quite narrow and, and sort of crisp, almost like little pinstripes compared to the female uh, purple finch. If we back up and look at the female purple finch, see it's got sort of broader, smudgier stripes, more like the thickness of the house finch. But the um, Cassin's finch has these crisp little streaks. Uh, and then beak wise, it's a pretty, it's kind of hard to tell because this one's eating a seed, but it's, it's a pretty straight beak. The beak is pretty similar to the, the beak shape of the, the purple finch. And the primary extension on the Cassin's finch is, is significantly longer. So again, these photos don't show it super well, but if you, see, if you think maybe you're looking at a Cassin's finch, definitely check out the primary extension. And you can see like the tips of the primaries come well out onto the tail here, even past the point where the undertail coverts meet the tail. Whereas on the, the house finch or the purple finch, this primary is probably stopping somewhere around in here. So it's a subtle difference and, you know, it's a lot easier to, to check this out on a photo where the bird's not moving and you can measure and really look carefully when the bird's flying around, it's, it's tougher. But um, they are more migratory, they cover more distance and that tends to be when you have longer primaries on a bird. If it's, if it's doing long range flying, it tends to have longer wings. Uh, here's its eBird histogram, excuse me, the, the sightings map and you can see relatively few sightings in Santa Barbara County. And at the point when I did this, you know, this screenshot, uh, there had been none in the past 30 days. And in fact, it's, it's quite rare to see this bird in Santa Barbara County. I don't think I have ever seen one in Santa Barbara County. This is one of those birds that I've seen up in the mountains on the, the Eastern Sierra. So, you know, I really want to see it down here, but uh, have not so far. 
Uh, it's up at high elevation typically that it's seen. So you wanna be up in pine trees up as high as you can get in Santa Barbara County. So this is like the Figueroa mountain area up here. This out here is the big pine mountain area, which is very hard to get to, but some people are lucky enough to get there. I'm looking enviously at Jenny because Jenny gets to go up there. Um, let's see. Uh, Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. Well, before I go on, any other any questions about that trio of finches? You know, they're all kind of similar looking, but they're all different enough that if you work at it and you know listen to the vocalizations and learn the vocalizations, uh, you can distinguish them. And you know, again, Casson's finch gonna be pretty hard to find in Santa Barbara, but but the first two, the house finch and the purple finch, you can find pretty readily. Okay, on we go. Uh, okay, so our trio of of goldfinches. Oh. I revealed it. I spoiled the mystery. This is not a very mysterious bird. If you're in carpentry and you've got those those thistle sock thistle seed socks out because you get a lot of these. Um, here's a recording by Lauren Harter. And then here's a recording by Jesse Fagan. So this is the, the lesser goldfinch. And as you're listening to that longer vocalization, they're mimics. Like you're hearing other birds, they're, they're mimicking other birds songs like a mockingbird does. Maybe not as obviously as a mockingbird does it, but there are other birds in there. Like I heard a flicker in there and something else. And it's like, oh, you can totally hear them doing that. And it's a, a good reminder. Um, I've talked about this when we talk about birding by ear. If you just hear a quick, you know, little piece of a distinctive bird vocalization and you think, oh, I got a such and such. I'm gonna put it on my list. There was a flicker. Listen more carefully for a second because you could well have a lesser goldfinch that's pretending to be a flicker. And if you just hear that one little bit of the song and jump to the conclusion that you've heard the actual bird, you may well fool yourself. Okay, so uh, these birds are relatively small. So again, if you're familiar with them, they're, they're, they're teensy little guys um, and gals. Uh, they actually have a range of uh, color morphs. So in the eastern part of the lesser goldfinches range, like in Texas, most of, or almost all of the males have completely black backs. They're, they're black all the way down. But out here where we are, they have more of this kind of olive greenish back, uh, most of them anyway. But occasionally you will see a black backed one around here. So that's kind of a fun thing. Again, like Kaufman talked about, if you check out, you know, if you've got 50 of them at your sock feeder, check them all out because they'll look different and you can learn about the range of, of variation that they have. Males look basically like this, again, with a fair amount of variation. Uh, females look basically like this, but again, with a fair amount of variation, you get drab ones and, and bright ones. You know, there's some that are more colorful or less colorful, but they all tend to have this kind of olive green thing going on is, is the thing I look for. Uh, this, these photos don't show up particularly well, but they often have this white check mark on the wings, this little spur of white that comes up, comes down off the wing bar. So you can look for that. It's a helpful sign that you're looking at a lesser goldfinch. Um, and then in flight, I think just the males, I'd have to consult my field guide and I apologize for not being better prepared, uh, but they actually have a, a big white patch in the wings that you can see when they're flying over you. And that again, will help you, uh, know that you're looking at a, a lesser goldfinch as opposed to some other kind of, of bird like the ones we're gonna look at in a minute. Uh, they are found all over. Yeah, Brody. Um, I have been seeing those and I had been wondering what they were because I haven't seen them before usually around here because I'm sort of new to birding. But yeah, that's sort of fun. And I can add the pictures too because I took some pictures of them. Excellent. Yeah, I would love to look at pictures of your goldfinches. So if you can do that for the meeting next week, that'll be really fun. Um, they're found, you know, throughout, this is kind of like that house finch map, you know, they're all over the place. Uh, a little bit zoomed in on Carpinteria. I think that's my house. Because <laughs> I have them around here. All right, here's another species. And I will play its recording. This is Bruce Lagerquist's recording. So 
So kind of similar to the lesser goldfinch vocalization, but different. Again, if you study them, you know, when you see them, when you see them out there and you're bird watching and they're vocalizing, you know, look at the bird and listen to the vocalization. That'll really help get that in your head, what the, the different ones sound like. Here's a, a recording by J.R. Rigby. This is the American goldfinch. Um, if you have them together on your feeder, the American and the lesser goldfinch, you can see the American is a little bit bigger, but it's still a pretty small bird. It's just a little bigger than the lesser goldfinch, which I guess explains why it's called the lesser goldfinch, because it's smaller. Um, so now the, the breeding male is, is pretty hard to miss. I mean, that's a, that's a really distinctive looking bird. It's just bright yellow. It's like bright yellow and dark black and so that, that's not too tough, but the non-breeding male, again, there's a wide range of variation. There's bright ones and dull ones, and they get pretty close to kind of lesser goldfinchy colors. You know, there's, there's a lot of overlap in terms of the, the basic look, if you're just looking quickly and sort of superficially, but some things to look for to help you distinguish them. The American goldfinch has more of a brownish cast going on, more of a brownish wash on its yellow not so much the olive green kind of yellow that the lesser goldfinch has. Um, and then another really good thing to look for is the under tail coverts. Uh, on the breeding male, it's, it's particularly obvious, but even on the, the non-breeding male, and these photos don't show it well, but they tend to be white in the under tail coverts, whereas with the lesser goldfinch, it tends to be yellowish or kind of that sort of olive yellow, kind of not, but not white, not a bright white. So this area here and the, the bottom part of the tail. So here's their distribution. And so they're around in pretty much, you know, the same areas as the lesser goldfinch, not as abundantly, but they're there if you look for them. Um, you know, here we are zoomed in a little bit, no red dots. So whenever I took this screenshot, this is pretty recently, apparently we haven't had American goldfinches reported in the last 30 days. Uh, but we almost always get them on the carpentry at Christmas count. And I think they are here during the breeding season too. So, I mean, I think they're out there. They're just not obvious. So look around for them. Oops. All right, we'll go on to this species. This is our last species. So this is a recording by Paul Marvin. It's just that very high kind of tinkling sound. Um, and here is a recording by Lance Benner. So again, it's very goldfinchy. It sounds a lot like those other goldfinches, but it's got that, that little bit of very high pitched kind of little tinkling notes mixed in there and some uh, some uh, mimicry also, you know, I heard a, I think I heard a kestrel in there and probably some other stuff. So this is the, the Lawrence's goldfinch. Um, and I just think they're really cool looking, uh, pretty distinctive. Maybe I appreciate the fact that I can tell them apart, you know, it's like not like struggling with those lesser goldfinches versus those American goldfinches and when they kind of overlap with the drab ones and the bright ones. Uh, Lawrence's goldfinches are pretty obvious. They've got that yellow on the wing is, is quite distinctive. Um, you know, there's pine siskins have some yellow on the wing also, and I haven't talked about pine siskins, even though they're kind of related to all these, uh, but I was trying to limit the number of birds we talked about. But pine siskins are very streaky. You know, they have lots of, uh, you know, brown, brown streaking on them. And uh, Lawrence's goldfinches do not. So if you see this kind of gray, very small bird with this, yellow on the wings like this. And if you see the male, you know, the spot of yellow on the breast and his black face, it's a Lawrence's goldfinch. And we do have them around here. Uh, they're more commonly encountered up in this part of the county, the northeastern part of the county, like the Cuyama Valley. But we do have a few of them around here. And, um, you know, if you're out there, if you hear, listen for that, that high-pitched tinkling sound. Uh, 
you know, there's a few up at um, like Ortega Ridge. This was actually me at the, the Montecito Reservoir Hawk Watch site, that little red dot there, because one came flying right past me. <laughs> and I heard the tinkling. I was like, oh, is that a Lawrence's goldfinch? And it flew like, you know, five feet in front of my face. And I got a really good look at it. So that was, that was fun. All right, that is it. And it's four minutes before 4.45. So I have saved a little bit of time. Um, so I'm very proud of myself. Yeah, thanks, Brody. I like the, the OK sign from Brody. Um, OK, I'm going to stop the screen share for a minute, at least. Uh, questions, comments, feedback? Yeah, James, I see you got or Jim, I see you got your hand up. You're, you're muted. I'm going to try and unmute you. Can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry. Um, I, I was trying to remember your bar chart of the various finches because, as you said, that the house finch I know is a thick bar chart all the way across. And we had a Niger feeder that we put up in the fall and were absolutely buried in uh, lesser gold finches and American gold finches through the winter. And um, we, we were seeing very few of those now. And I was trying to uh, remember your bar chart with those. Should we be seeing those all year round? We 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 could hardly keep our Niger uh, feeder filled during the during the um, winter months, and now the we haven't seen much for a while. I'm going to go back and look. So because I I don't remember, and again I'm conscious of the fact that I frequently just start misleading folks when I'm doing it off the cuff. Okay, so here we are. Um, so you know, they pretty the. Yeah. Pretty steady, you know. The purple finch gets pretty thin. The Lawrence's goldfinch gets pretty thin, you know, in the late summer. Um, but that doesn't mean they're not moving around. I mean, it, you know, they're showing up on the same proportion, the same rough percentage of lists, but they could be in a right. different area still. Yeah, thank you. And it it does get thinner. Like I see, you know, American goldfinch is thicker here than mm -hmm. it is here in the breeding months. So. Um, yeah. Of course, we're we have many many house finches all year here at the house, and and yeah. uh, but the other two have uh, have moved on somewhere in the, in the last forty five days. Yeah, but thank you. And yeah. another thing that goes on too is you know they they split off into pairs for for breeding purposes, and then after they've raised the brood or whatever, they'll reassemble into these big flocks, and then you'll see them like in the winter, and you know you'll have like you say you have you know thirty or forty of them at your sock feed. You're like oh my right. gosh, there's so many. Well, they're just concentrated at your feeder as opposed to being spread out across the landscape. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Okay, so uh, I, I wanna do this, this game. I'm not sure we're gonna be able to get through the whole thing. Uh, you know, the, the eBird photo quiz is fun for me, um, but we're gonna try and do it in a, a sort of collective way. So the idea is, well, actually, I'm going to need to share the screen again. So let me get that going. All right. And let's see. OK. Um, go to eBird. And as we were sort of testing this, um, one idea we, we had was that we would make it a little less intimidating. So uh, as part of this process, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through a quiz that, that eBird has. And oh, I wanna sign in, I'm gonna make me sign in to do this. Okay, I'm gonna start the quiz. So to make it uh, less intimidating, uh, we're gonna collect your, your guesses, if that makes sense, without you having to reveal what your guess is. So you don't have to worry about being publicly wrong, if that makes sense. Um, so the way we worked out to do this is, uh, Laurel, are you in the, the chat? I don't have you in my, my thumbnails right now, Laurel, but can you unmute and tell me? If yeah, you're I'm all okay. set. Okay, so Laurel is here. So you can use the Zoom chat feature to send a private chat message to Laurel. So as we go through the quiz, we're gonna collect guesses, but don't announce your guess. Don't say your guess publicly to the group. Just text your, or use the Zoom chat to send your guess to Laurel. And she will then summarize the guesses for us. So you don't have to worry about being publicly wrong. If you're wrong, it doesn't matter. You'll just be lumped into the collective. And Laurel will know who said what, but 
she'll keep it secret. So you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Maybe this is more involved than it needs, but let's just try it. Let's see how this works, okay? So in eBird, uh, we can set up this quiz. We're gonna do it from here in Carpinteria somewhere. We'll make it today's date. So make it the 11th. Now we're interested in photos and let's start the quiz. So what eBird is doing, by the way, is they wanna collect um, ratings. So it's showing us all, it's showing us unrated photos and they'd like to collect ratings because then they can use the ratings of the photos to use it more usefully in their interface. Um, so they're showing us the photo and eBird knows how this bird was identified in the list that it was submitted with, but they're not telling us. So they're asking us to figure out what it is. So looking at this photo, not saying it out loud, these are your choices over here on the right. So go ahead and uh, send to Laurel which of these choices you think this bird is. And I have to figure out how I send it to Laurel because I lost my chat. There we go, there's my chat. And you're not sending it to everyone, just to Laurel. Uh, there she, she's down at the bottom of my list where it says Laurel S. Luby co-host. And, and, and you're not necessarily saying the name of the bird, you're saying the choice, right? Because they use none of the above a lot in these. Okay, so I have sent my uh, list to Laurel. Andrea, good try, but you sent it to everyone, but that's okay. Um, but send it, try and send it just to Laurel. And uh, so we'll give you just a few more seconds to figure that out. And then we'll, we'll ask Laurel to collect, uh, to summarize the, the input. So does anybody need more time? Is everybody good? Can we move forward? Okay, let's move forward. So Laurel, can you summarize what the guesses were or who, what had the most guesses? Um, none of the above had three, Brant's had three, double crested had one. Oh, so we need to break the tie between none of the above and Brant's. How can we break the tie? Who's, who's willing to, to go out on a limb and break the tie for us? Someone willing to, to publicly break the tie here? Someone volunteer to break the tie. Jim, I see you shrugging. What do you think, Jim? I guessed Brant's. Okay, let's choose Brant's. Oh, so hard. We were not quite right. It was a double crested cormorant, which was the none of the above choice. Um, they're pretty similar. Uh, the, the orange guler pouch, the, this little guler area down here is, is a good indication of double crested cormorant. Yeah. Brant's is more like yellow, like a light yellow down there. Yeah. Anyway, cool. that's okay. And then we have to rate the image and I'm just gonna do the rating myself and I'm gonna say that's a, it's a two. Okay. Here's a fun bird. This bird has been featured prominently in the SBCO birding list over the last week. Um, okay, so go ahead and uh, send Laurel your guess about this bird. I have sent my guess to Laurel. Anyone want more time? All right, hearing no objection. Laurel, what have we guessed? You still summarizing? <laughs> okay, wait a minute, I just got another one. I have two for none of the above, one for American Red Star, one for Cape, and one for Northern Perula. Well, that is in so fact what it is, but that's above. not one of the choices. So we're going to count that oh. as a none of the above. Okay. And yeah, <laughs> that is actually what it is. It's the Northern Parla, which is, again, a, a cool rarity for Santa Barbara County. And there's a, a pair of them apparently up by Nahoki, uh, Nahoki Falls Park. That, uh, wow. Who found that? Pete Schneekloth, I think. He was driving by, actually heard the bird as he was driving and stopped and pulled over and found it. So that's pretty fun. And I'm going to say that's a two as well. I'm a pretty... Pretty tough judge. Okay, so here's our, our third bird. Um, go ahead and send Laurel your guess. And we'll try and we'll try and pick it up because I'm I'm past you know the cutoff time, but but this is so much fun, right? It's fun for me anyway. I appreciate those of you who've chosen to stay to enjoy the fun game.
Okay, Laurel, what have, what have we got in terms of guesses? Everyone be, um, did long build curlew. Ah, wisdom of the crowds. Yes, we are correct. The long build curlew. It's eating something. Was that like a sand crab maybe at the at the shore? Pretty cool. I like them. I, I'll call that a three, I guess, because the sand crab is fun. Oh boy, challenging. <laughs> Not giving us much to work with here. Um, okay, so uh, a few hints that, that may be helpful. So when they give you one like this and you can't really see it very well, you know, you're kind of trying to figure out what are they doing. There are some clues you can see on the screen. Now this was actually, a photo was taken in Florida in January, but it's around here now, right? Because we told it we wanted it to constrain the, the choices to things that are around here now. So you're thinking of a turn that's in Florida in January, but it's also around Carpinteria in June. Um, and, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> send your message, send your guest to Laurel. What? I'm saying send your guesses. Uh. There's no penalty for being wrong here. It's just for glory. <laughs> <laughs> and we're doing good things for science. We're, we're adding ratings to their database. So, so Ebert is happy. Okay, Laurel, what do we have? We have five Caspian. Oh. We are all wrong. It says Forster's. Uh, you know, I don't think that is a Forster's turn. That tail does not, that fork does not look deep enough. You know, we could report it as misidentified, but I'd want to take the time to, which can happen too. You can come across one of these, these quizzes and go, oh man, they're just wrong, whoever submitted that. But um, I'm not going to bother because I want to get through to the end of the quiz and I would want to get my field guide out and spend some quality time examining it and seeing if it's worth reporting it. So I'm just going to rate it. I'm rating that a one because I'm so distraught at have, us having it gotten wrong. Okay, this should be a little more straightforward. Give you a few more seconds to spam Laurel with the answer. Does this quiz pull up specific, specifically local birds or is it pretty random? Yeah, I told it, I, I, it asks you, you know, what sort of area do you want to constrain it to? And I gave it like right around here. And so it's, you don't have to do that. You can make it wherever you want. And it'd be a good way to learn birds in another area if you're going to go there. But um, I'm just doing it for around here. All right, Laurel, what do we have? A oh, great horned owl. Is it a consensus? Yes. <laughs> and we are correct. Yay. Giving that one a two as well. Oh, look at that attractive bird. All right. What is the verdict? Everyone log a head strike. Yeah. That was pretty pretty easy. I'm giving that a three. All right. You probably are all fast typists. What do we have, Laurel? Everyone, American coup. Yes. Now, you know, there was a common gallinule reported today from Lake Los Carneros. You know, the people are kind of up hanging out in that northern part of Lake Los Carneros because of the leaf bittering that's been there. And uh, apparently someone had a common gallinule there today. So that's kind of fun. I just thought of that because it's on the list. But yeah, definitely a coot. Uh, okay. Hmm. Yes, we may require a little more thought. I like these quizzes because it's kind of like bird watching. You know, you get an easy one and then you get one that just like sets you back like, wait a second. 
Uh, okay, what do we have, Laurel? Um, wait a minute, I still have ones coming in. Okay, yeah, I didn't mean to jump the gun there. I have three, none of the above. That's the, the leading contender? Yes. All right, we are correct. It is in fact a Cassin's Kingbird, which was not on the list, so it's none of the above. And give that one a two. Oh, that's fun. Jenny's getting help, I can see, but she's muted, so that's okay. Oh. All right, are the guesses in? I have three none of the above and two Lewis Woodpecker. All right, uh, none of the above? Five none of the above. Five none of the above, okay, let's go with that. It is, in fact, a downy woodpecker with a cute little beak. <laughs> I'm giving, uh, I'm giving that one a one. Can't really see much of the bird. Oh, here's a cool one. Right, this is fun where you just get to see. This is kind of like bird watching, where you just see a weird little piece of the bird, right? It's not like a field guide illustration. It's just like, can you identify it from its back? Uh, send in my guess. All right, does anyone need more time? All right, Laurel, what's the- Five Northern Flicker. Correct, woohoo. But only one star, because it's not a very good, I mean, it's a, it's a fun photo, but it's not a, not a high rated photo in eBird terms. Oh, wow, this is cool. Okay. Hmm. So when um, so when you're playing this game and you're really focused on trying to get all 20, trying to get 20 out of 20, like maybe is a thing that you might do if you're like me. Um, and I'm studying the field guides and I and then I get a photo like this and I'm like, oh come on, give me a break. And, you know. Anyone else? So make your guesses, whatever it is. All right, what do we have for guesses, Laurel? I have two Canada ghosts and two none. Hmm, okay, we have to break the tie. Uh, anybody wanna jump in there and does someone feel strongly about this? None. Okay, none of the above. Let's see what we get. Oh no, it was a Canada goose. So is that just you like being strategic, Rody? Just thinking, well, none comes up a lot, so maybe it's none of the above, or is there a specific other bird that you were thinking it was? No, I didn't. I just didn't really think it was a Canada goose, so I went with none of the above. Yeah. Well, often it is correct in these games to choose none of the above, but but not this time. They, at least in terms of the person who submitted this list, they said it was a Canada goose, and presumably they had a better look at it than than the photo shows. So we'll take their word for it. I was thrown off because I just always assumed geese fly in formation and this was kind of mixed up. Yeah, a little, little bit of a messy, messy flock pattern. Okay, there is a bird that is at least easier to see. Shouldn't be on a wire. Yeah, I think with photos is, you know, you get some, it's just a snapshot of an instant in time. And it's like, well, that's what the bird was at that moment. Laurel, what are our, what are our jury say? What does our jury say? California Toey. We are correct. Hooray for us. I'm going to give this one a four. It's a pretty good photo. All righty. 
So what did, who, who had a bird at their head? That was really interesting sounding, whatever it was. Is that an actual bird or is that like someone playing recordings off a, I don't know, we're trying to get through this. I'll stay focused. Um, and I haven't put my guessing. All right, my guess is in. All right, what are our what are our guesses, Laurel? I have one black turn, one Caspian turn, and one turn. One just we say one. Oh, someone just said turn. Well, yeah, it's a turn. <laughs> right, You're definitely right, but it's not one of the choices. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I don't know who wants to who wants to commit. Who wants to go out there on a limb and say what they think this bird is? It's not a great shot. So, you know, if you're not right, that's, you know, all right, I'll, I'll go out on a limb. I'm going to, I'm going to own up. I'm the one who said Caspian turn. So I'm going to guess that's what it is. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Relatively heavy beak is what I was seeing there. And also the dark under the primaries here is kind of a Caspian turn thing and a, not too deep a fork. I actually thought that one earlier that was identified as a Forster's, I thought that was a Caspian too. So because of the, the size of the fork and the tail. I'm not a big turn expert though. All right, we'll give that two stars. Um, oh, hey, this is fun. Uh, yeah, okay. I feel like this is one of those that you either learned this one or you haven't. I mean, it's, it's that bird. It's very clearly pictured here. Um, all right. Uh, our guess is still coming in, or are we ready to call it? Four scaly breasted munia. Scaly breasted munia. Yay. Um, so I would give this one probably a three or a four, but eBird tells you in the rating guidelines to take off if they put a watermark. So if they put their text on top of it, they lose a point. So I'm going to drop this one down to, I guess, two. All right, here is a familiar species. I'm guessing we're gonna be able to call this one pretty quickly, Laurel. Is there a, a trend already? Yes, all mallard. Okay, it is in fact a mallard. Oh, yeah. All right, what is the consensus? Two Western go. That's the, that's the top vote getter? Yes, oh, three, we just got another three, Western go. All three of us were right, hooray. Oh, excellent. Okay, so we just covered this species. All right, what do we think we have here? I need extra time on this because it's gonna it's gonna be my fault if we get this one wrong because I just presented this bird. <laughs> Want to make sure you give this a lot of careful thought, <laughs> or I'll be wrong and that'll be super embarrassing. Because these birds are kind of tricky. I mean, you know, they're pretty similar. <sighs> Okay, time to face the music. What do we have, Laura? All purple finch. Please may it be so. Yay! <laughs> in fact, purple <laughs> finch. All right, Kevin Happy, I'm bumping him up to three stars. Ooh, tricky. Okay. Not a lot to work with here. Kind of small and distant. Oh, man. All right. Fresno. 
doesn't mean it's a common bird in Fresno, you know, could have been a, a Fresno rarity that someone took a photo of. Okay, what is the, what is the crowd think? All voted none of the, of the above. They all voted none of the above. Hopefully we are yep. correct. Yay, Snowy Egret. One star. Have we just got two left? What a cute little bird. Okay, what do people think? Oak titmouse. Oak titmouse is correct. And I guess I'll go to four. Well, it doesn't show the whole bird though. Who knows three? Oh, it's cute. This will be our final, final bird. Photograph in Cochise, Arizona. All right. What do people think, Laurel? Uh, three Wilson Warbler. That is it. That is what it is. All right. And our final score is 17 out of 20. Not too shabby. And again, I'm not sure that's a Foster's turn or Forster's turn. So. You know, I think there's a good chance we were actually correct on that one as well. Okay, can I, well, yeah. Um, can I share the lesser um, goldfinch that I've been before? So you want to share it in what sense? You want to like put the, the image up for us? Um, I could, yeah. Wait, like share my content. So um, the way I've got the meeting set up is that only the host can share the screen, um, uh. which I... I have no concerns about you sharing your screen. I'm just not sure that technically I can do it. So I'm going to say, can we hold that for the next meeting and uh, forward yes. that to uh, forward that to Tom? I think was how we were going to do this was to forward your your list to Tom or your images to Tom, and we'll make sure that we we yes. show it to everyone next time. And I'll also research in the meantime to see if I can figure out you know maybe it's something I can just change on the fly and let someone else share their screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, well. Thank you, everyone. Um, we haven't talked about what to do next time other than sharing our, our lists. Uh, does anybody have a strong, yeah, James. Um, I have an ulterior motive about this, I'm embarrassed to say. <laughs> but um, my wife and I were having coffee this morning outside and, and we thought of all your great talks and we thought, what about owls? And, and the ulterior motive part of it is we were gifted an owl box over the winter and I installed it um, next to a field here on our, at, near our house, hoping for tenants next winter, probably. But I realized how little I really know about owls. And uh, so anyway, sometime or sometime in the coming weeks, no, I, no, I would, uh, I would we, go three cheers for owls. We have done owls in the past, which I like because it means I've already got a presentation prepared. So it's easy. It's yeah, I, I was thinking me. I'd have, yeah. And, um, and it's a fun group and we haven't done it in a while. So sure, yeah, I will totally do owls. And this right. is kind of a good time of year because they're, they're hooting a lot, you know, and as they start to raise their young, you're gonna hear even more hooting. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about owls. Okay, okay. Uh, anything else? Any other feedback, input, requests, random? Um, just yeah. on the topic of owls, I saw one barn owl and two screech owls, not, um, I think, Four days ago, I think. Wow, and you actually saw them? Yeah. You didn't just hear them? Yeah, we saw them, we saw them. We have a few nesting boxes. What, ah. The barn owl was in the tree, the screech owls were in the box. Cool, yeah. yeah I, uh, awesome. I don't, I don't know if I've even seen a screech owl ever. I've heard them a bunch of times, but I don't think I've ever seen one. I've never been around, you know, if it's, it helps to have like a roost or an nest box or something where they 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 yeah. tend to come to and then you can you can just see them when they're there. Well, that's very cool. Yeah, I think that is really neat. All right. Well, we'll we'll hear more about your owls at the next meeting, uh, since we will be doing owls. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you for playing. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. For, thank you. And, uh, Great game. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, and we'll, we'll we'll do it again sometime. And uh, I'll see you next Thursday. So so long. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank